I was um, planning on coming up there, I thought I better revise my title. And instead of saying uh, the year of William Moultrie, the Battle of Sullivan's Island and Declaration of Independence, I thought I would probably rearrange things to say what happened in South Carolina while the Continental Congress considered the Declaration of Independence. I live in Thomasville, Georgia, in the southwest part of the state. I'm just 15 miles from Tallahassee, Florida, but I'm also 30 miles away from Moultrie, Georgia, where they badly mispronounced the name, and there's no way to fix that. I've mangled it myself for the last 30 years or so, so you'll, you'll hear me uh, mispronounce it. It's properly the Scottish Moultrie, or perhaps even Moultrie, with the uh, silent L. Um, like Victoria said, I'm an anesthesiologist and I have a tendency to put people to sleep. I certainly hope that won't be the case this evening, but if I do, I reserve the right to send you a bill afterwards. Now, doctors can hardly talk without leaning on PowerPoint as a crutch, and I'm certainly no exception to this rule, but the science is settled that it, audience attention wanes after about 10 to 15 minutes. So what I plan to do is to present um, a series of five to 10 minute segments. And in order to keep your attention, I've tried to minimize the number of slides that look like this. But while I'm talking, I'm gonna cover in, in a small way every one of these topics. And you can see I've already covered a few. We've talked about anesthesiology and history and public speaking and cartography. Let's see, there's one. I'm not sure if you're familiar with polio, polioresthetics. That's the study of siege warfare. Now, for me, for a long time, I understood the Battle of Sullivan's Island in the most superficial way. The British came to Charleston Harbor. They blasted away at a little fort for the better part of a day and being unsuccessful in their conquest, they turned around and went home. And in South Carolina, we put a palmetto tree on our flag, but there's really far more to it. And we're gonna get off into the weeds a little bit before we're done. For myself, this journey began in 2007 when I was fortunate enough to become a member of the Society of Cincinnati of the state of South Carolina. Unfortunately, my knowledge of the Revolutionary War in South Carolina was limited to what I had learned by watching The Patriot starring Mel Gibson. So you can imagine that I had quite a lot of catching up to do. But when I did start studying the revolution, I found that most of what I could find, most of what I could read was limited at first to the Northern Theater. You know, here we have Lexington and Concord and Washington crossing the Delaware and, and Saratoga and Bunker Hill. And to a certain degree, this is because the South lost the Civil War. When that happened, the uh, Northern states owned the historical narrative and the uh, ability to publish. So for, the, for many, many years, um, and this is a Venn diagram. You may remember it from second grade math and set theory and such, but um, for most of the country, the Revolutionary War looks something like this, where you have it in North America, and here's the revolution in the Northern Theater, and way down here, maybe uh, we'll think about South Carolina a little bit, but if you're from South Carolina, I assure you it looks more like this. And there's a reason for that. If you look at the number of battles and skirmishes and engagements that took place during the war, look at South Carolina. I counted 67 of these. And while I can't verify the veracity of this chart, this just something I found online at the francismarientrail.com, there is some truth to the fact that way more fighting took place in South Carolina than virtually anywhere else. This map is from uh, General McCready's History of South Carolina in 1780 to 83, written in 1902. And I've circled the big named battles. Here's Calpins and Kings Mountain, uh, Buford. That's the Waxhaw Massacre 
uh, Hobkirk's Hill, Camden, Utah Springs, of course, there was three battles in Charleston. And I included the Georgia battles of Augusta and Savannah because largely those were um, South Carolina troops. Right about the bicentennial, interest in the Southern theater uh, increased. And since then, there's been quite a number of really good books written on the subject. And I would recommend any of these books to you. Um, they're all very good, but before you read any of them, you, you need to read mine first, okay? Now that we've covered that. So what I wanna cover in the next little bit um, in my series of short talk, topics, I wanna talk about the iconic Colonel William Moultrie and his South Carolina soldiers and the small fort on Sullivan's Island in Charleston Harbor that they inhabited. I'll talk about British strategy and tactics and why they lost the Battle of Sullivan's Island. And finally, I'll get into the impact and influence of the, on the Declaration of Independence. And, and that was really kind of a two-way street. And then I'll circle back to uh, William Moultrie before finishing. So when I'm in South Carolina giving this talk, which I've done a number of times, in order to get their attention, I start off with this provocative statement saying that Moultrie was not, a, not universally admired for his leadership skills. Well, in fact, he was, but that, that was just, that's just a ploy uh, I used to wake everybody up. But when I was studying the revolution in South Carolina, of course, I came across Francis Marion, uh, General Pickens, General Sumter, and I include uh, Daniel Morgan and Nathaniel Green on, on this list too, because even though they were Northern generals, they had such an impact in South Carolina. But I really could not find much of anything about William Moultrie at all. And to, so a friend of mine suggested that maybe I should write a book about him, and that's what I did. That one, that's Crescent Moon over Carolina. So who was William Moultrie? Well, he was all of these things. He was a son, a husband, a planner, legislator, soldier, a businessman. He was born in 1730, so he was two years older than George Washington. And he was the second son of Dr. John Moultrie, a beloved Charleston physician who had achieved a relatively high level of social status. He received his education locally. He did not uh, travel to England and France for education as so many of his peers did. And his friends described him as cheerful, manly, sincere, unassuming and unostentatious and conciliating. And he, he clearly possessed the very character traits that we would find attractive in an amiable companion. But some of these traits were considered impediments to a effective leadership. And we'll get some opinion on that in a minute. Now, some would say that William Moultrie made his money the old fashioned way. He married. He and Damaris Elizabeth de St. Julian were married in 1749. Now she was a daughter from a wealthy Huguenot family and the couple had two children, a daughter who died at age 13 and a son, William Jr., who would later serve alongside his father in the Continental Army. And they made their home here at at Northampton Plantation, um, which unfortunately is now um, covered uh, by a lake. When he was in his 30s, Moultrie, Moultrie, I got Moultrie marched in the uh, campaigns against the Cherokee Indians in the uh, hinterlands of South Carolina, which really was the South Carolina um, version of the French and Indian War. Um, during the period of calm that, that followed, though, he, was, he served in the legislature and participated in agriculture, and, but he always remained active in the militia. And I show you this slide for a couple reasons, just to give you an idea of what the, the South Carolina provincial troops uniforms looked like in 1760, especially this crescent here on their cap. There's a lot of argument about, about where this comes from, but I believe it comes from the crest of Lieutenant Governor William Bull, who was the acting governor of South Carolina at the time. 
Now, the Cherokee Wars provided a military apprenticeship for young South, Carolina, South Carolinians in later events would, would really prove that they profited from their experience. During the relative calm, he remained at home and like I said, in the legislature and in the militia. But here's a number of, of names that some of you may be familiar with who uh, served during the Cherokee Wars, especially Francis Marion and Christopher Gadsden. Y'all probably heard of them. Now, Charleston was the economic, social, and political epicenter of South Carolina, surpassed only in size by Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. But Charleston was probably the wealthiest of them all. And this it really isn't the time to go through the history of British op oppression in the Northern colonies, but suffice it to say that many South Carolinians understood that if the Port of Charleston were to suffer the same fate as Boston, the economy of South Carolina would be devastated. And though not especially radical, William Moultrie became a member of several of the underground extra legal committees that formed the shadow government of South Carolina as uh, South Carolina sort of pulled away from royal rule. In 1775, South Carolina broke away from royal rule altogether and began to militarize by forming a number of regiments of which William Moultrie became Colonel of the second regiment. And here you see that the uniforms were very reminiscent of the uniforms of 1760, complete with the crescent on the cap and when he was asked to design a flag for South Carolina, Moultrie took that crescent and he put it on the, um, on the flag in the right corner. And you'll see there's nothing here. Later, there'll be a, a, a palmetto tree. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a, a couple more images of what the uniforms Look like this was painted by Henry Bembridge, a local uh, Charleston artist. This is a more contemporary image here. Um, let me jump back just a second. One thing that's important to, to realize that the Continental Congress tried to incorporate the South Carolina regiments into the Continental Army um, in November of 1775. And South Carolina basically said, thank you, but no thanks. We're gonna keep our regiments um, under our own control right now than under the Continental Establishment. So in a minute, when I'm talking about the Battle of June 28, 1776, remember that this was not Continental Army yet. They would later be Continental Army, but, but not yet. So this was my go-to map. Uh, about Charleston for a while. Here you have the Ashley River and the Cooper River. In Charleston, they'll say that the Ashley and Cooper Rivers come together to form the Atlantic Ocean. And here you have uh, Sullivan's Island. But I found this image, which I really like much better. And so here you have the Ashley River here, the Cooper River here, the Charleston Peninsula. This is uh, John's Island with Fort Johnson right here, Morris Island and Sullivan's Island right here. And all of these particular geographic places that I'm pointing out to you will, will come into play in, in just a minute. Now Charleston had um, quite a number of sandbars that made navigation difficult. And that's what I'm depicting with these bars right here. In fact, on this bar right here, um, in much later in the future, there will be a very famous fort constructed there You've probably heard of it, Fort Sumter. But anyway, the ship channel uh, to get from outside of the harbor to town, the ship channel came this way, and then it came right close to here on Sullivan's Island before going the rest of the way to town. Now, I said that South Carolina began to militarize in uh, June of 1775. In September, they took control of Fort Johnson from the British in November and December, they began fortifying the town of Charleston and they took control of Sullivan's Island on December 1775. Fort Johnson was here on John's Island, like I mentioned earlier. And this was one of those uh, situations where 
where Moultrie was not exactly uh, admired for his leadership, uh, a gentleman named Thomas Ferguson, who was a member of the Council of Safety, wrote to his father-in-law, Christopher Gadsden, who was serving in the Continental Congress, and he said, our little army really wants you. Colonel Moultrie is a very good man, but very indolent and easy, so that things go on very slow. Now, mind you, they'd only been out there a couple of weeks. But uh, Ferguson said, we have had the fort in possession for about 20 days, and he was desired to put it in good order as soon as possible and spare no expense, but very little has been done. Another one of uh, Moultrie's detractors was General Charles Lee, who came on the scene in June 1776. Now, this is William Moultrie. This is an artist's depiction of Charles Lee, and it's very difficult to find a good portrait of Charles Lee. He was not very well liked and turned out to be a bad guy, but at this point in time, he was still one of the good guys. But he was a martinet rigidly and harshly critical, dictatorial, uh, somewhat vulgar, um, accustomed to having his orders obeyed by professional European soldiers. He had served in the British Army, and he was generally considered one of the contenders for command of the Continental Army as a whole before it went to George Washington. He had mostly negative opinions about Moultrie's leadership qualities. Uh, he thought that that Moultrie was, um, he fraternized too much and with his men and that he needed to be more aggressive and to exert himself more. And the two, these two men really mixed like oil and water. Now the officers of the South Carolina provincial troops were, came from the gentry. They were educated and generally speaking sons of the elites. But what about the common soldiers? under Moultrie's command, the men inside the fort that they would build, the privates. We hear very little about them. Most of them are immigrants or poor white men of low social standing. And like most of their officers, very few of them had ever come under fire or, or been in a fight unless they were fighting each other, which apparently was very common. But here is one thing that we do know about the enlisted men, and it's very illustrative if we remember that the South Carolina troops were not yet part of the Continental Army. Now, in the Continental Army at that time, and these are um, the Continental Articles of War right here. In, in the Continental Army, certain infractions were punishable by not more than 39 lashes. And the, the 39 lashes is actually biblical. In Deuteronomy, Moses said uh, that a guilty person may receive 40 lashes, um, not more. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said that he received 40 lashes, less one. General Lee, however, said that the reason that the South Carolina troops were not coming into continental service was that the South Carolinians believed that the punishments were not strong enough and that 39 lashes would be too mild for the perverse soldiery of this meridian and would prove to be but a light breakfast. Well, you know, he, ours is a tough crowd down in South Carolina, but I think he really, um, in effect, paid us a, a backhanded compliment. So now we've got the colonel to lead the men, and we've got the men, and now we need a fort to put them in, and so I always just thought of Sullivan's Island and the little fort on Sullivan's Island as just being a, a log square. Well, William Moultrie lived to be in his uh, 70s, and, and towards the end of his life, he published his memoirs. And he, he said on the second page, in the course of this reading, it'll be found how ignorant we were in the art of war in the commencement of our revolution. And he really was not kidding. Um, they fortified Sullivan's Island right here. By Christmas time, they had a battery and they decided to build a fort in January. But by March, not much of anything had been done. Instead of making a fort made out of masonry or pine trees or oak trees or, or whatever, 
they chose the palmetto tree, which is indigenous to the area. And apparently at that particular time, there was quite a lot of them. They didn't know how um, fortuitous a choice th this would be. Palmetto logs had never been used to for fortification in the past and they, they just were doing what they thought they could do. Um, but they contracted with a local man to deliver palmetto logs to Sullivan's Island as many as he could, as fast as he could, until they told him to stop and, and so on. Now, we don't know exactly who designed the fort. Uh, Moultrie had a French engineer Ferdinand de Brom out there with him. So it's, it's easy to assume that maybe de Brom designed the fort. De Brom certainly would have been familiar with the work of John Muller, who wrote the um, treatise on fortification. And it really does look like the fort on Sullivan's Island. It, it looks like they just tore a page from the book because that's, his, that's what it looked like. Now, at the time of the battle that we'll be talking about momentarily, the fort was maybe half finished, um, not more. It was finished on this side and in front, but you can see that the back side and the, the right side were not finished. When I first started doing this talk, it was football season. So I used a lot of um, football fields to, to give an idea of, of the size. So you can see that this fort would probably straddle um, six football fields. And in fact, not, not including the end zones, you could put the better part of two football fields inside the fort. You can imagine I had a good time making these slides. So all we ever heard was palmetto log, palmetto log, palmetto log. It's on the flag, the fort was made of palmetto logs, but, but really the palmetto logs served as a veneer over 16 feet of sand. And, and this gives you some idea of, of what it might have looked like. I've got quite a number of these uh, slides. This was painted by um, Lieutenant Henry Gray, who was present inside the fort during the battle. This is a, a British view of the fort here. This one comes from the Charleston Museum. It's a diorama, and I think very well illustrates the fact that this part of the fort was was finished. There was a uh, a wall here. The troops camped here on the inside. Here in what was going to be the northeast bastion was where the powder magazine was. This was considered the safest spot for that and all of this was swamp. I've never understood exactly why they built a fort on top of a swamp it said that maybe all of this was swamp and this was the only high ground. And this is from the South Carolina Battlefield Trust. So I think by now you've probably got a good idea of what, what the fort looked like. Um, the area, according to Moultrie, was quite a wilderness and with the swamp and uh, so forth. So here is the Southeast Bastion with the flag. And you can see how this wall is complete the tents inside. This is almost like one of those Where's Waldo slides. There's just so much here. This, this side and the back side, they just had planked up. And you can kind of get an idea. They call this the morass. That was the word they used for swamp. This is present day Fort Moultrie, uh, a fort. From, and if you superimpose the boundaries of the original fort, this is what you would would get. So in yellow, I have the original fort, 1776 to 1791. There was one in the interim that's not shown. And then this fort here was built uh, just prior to the War of 1812. Now, not everybody thought that defending a fort on Sullivan's Island was a good idea. In fact, Captain Clement Lempriere, who commanded a small sloop in Charleston Harbor, and, and was a good friend of William Moultrie's thought it was a terrible idea, as did quite a lot of folks in and around Charleston. Um, uh, Lynn Priere told Moultrie, he said, you know, the British ships are gonna pull up to this fort and knock it down in half an hour. And Moultrie answered him, he said, well, if they do, we'll just fight from the ruins. That's how committed 
he was to um, defending this fort. I mentioned Charles Lee earlier. Lee thought that this fort was a slaughter pen and he urged that they evacuate that fort as soon as they could. But the South Carolinians, uh, Governor John uh, Rutledge and Moultrie decided that um, they were gonna hold that fort no matter what. Uh, Rutledge wrote to Moultrie, General Lee wishes you to evacuate the fort. You will not do so without an order from me. I would sooner cut off my right hand than write one. So all that being said, um, I wanna introduce a term to you real quickly called outcome bias. And outcome bias means that when we know how a situation ends, that makes the steps leading up to the ending all seem reasonable and correct and proper. But in this case, uh, it's easy to have outcome bias. We know in, in advance that we won the battle, so everything seems hunky-dory, but that's really not, not true. It's, even though General Lee turned out not to be a good guy, it's really hard to disagree with what he said about the, dan the danger of defending that fort. I mean, how could they expect to survive much less win? And how could William Moultrie be so confident? I can only believe that since the, the open channel to town would take the British right past the fort, um, they had no choice but to defend their position there. They, that was the only thing that they could do. One other thing about Charles Lee um, is that he insisted that William Moultrie build a bridge. Now here's Sullivan's Island right here with the fort. And um, this is the mainland. And Lee was very concerned that there was no escape route for the inevitable disaster that was about to befall the guys inside the fort. And he insisted that Moultrie build a bridge there. And over a period of about, about three or four days, he sent 10 dispatches saying, build a bridge, how's the bridge coming? Have you completed the bridge yet? And they made kind of a half-hearted attempt to construct a pontoon bridge, but as soon as they sent some men across it, they saw that it wouldn't support them. And so there was a great deal of passive aggressivity going on between Moultrie and Lee. And it's clear that on the morning of the battle, if Lee could have found Moultrie, he would have relieved him of command. And before I get any further into the battle, I need to mention on the north end of Sullivan's Island, right here, where Colonel William Thompson was stationed with uh, 780 South Carolina provincials to ward off any incursion from the north. From uh, This is now Isle of Palms. It was called Long Island back then. So here we have the, the colonel, the fort, the soldiers, and now let's talk a little bit about the British. So on the 1st of June, 1776, the people of Charleston looked out and what they saw was upwards of 50 vessels commanded by Commodore Sir Peter Parker anchored just outside of Charleston Harbor. And on board, he carried 4,000 seasoned redcoats under the command of Major General Henry Clinton and Major General Charles Earl Cornwallis. I'm sure you've heard of, of both of them. Clinton and Parker were both first-rate officers, although Clinton was somewhat neurotic, according to a, a psychiatric historian who, who studied the man. Um, but they were both very disdainful of the provincials in South Carolina. Now, Clinton and Parker decided that uh, Clinton would land here on the south end of Long Island. So remember a couple slides back, I showed you uh, Colonel Thompson here. So Clinton lands with 3,000 redcoats on uh, Long Island under the presumption that he derived from looking at the maps that said dry at low water, that he would be able to march his men across and attack this position. And, and it's almost inconceivable that he wouldn't do a re reconnaissance earlier, but he waited until he had all 3,000 men 
over here. And then he did a reconnaissance and to his mortification, he found that this area here, which was about a mile long, was not um, dry at low water. It was 17 feet deep. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, Peter Parker believes that the reduction of a fort is a naval affair anyway, and he, he really doesn't seem that unhappy to have Clinton out of his hair. And even though Clinton's kind of bombarding him with suggestions about how he can be useful, since it's obvious he's not going to wait across um, to Sullivan's Island from Long Island, but, but Parker just kind of ignores what he's saying uh, for the most part. Here's a bird's eye view that shows you um, where everybody was situated on the morning of June 28, 1776. You had Peter Parker and all of his ships in an area called Five Fathom Hole off Morris Island. You had Christopher Gadsden, who had come home from the Continental Congress. He was here at Fort Johnson. Charles Lee had troops defending uh, Charleston itself in case the British made it past uh, the, the fort on Sullivan's Island, where you had Moultrie and 435 South Carolinians. You had a few Continentals over here in Mount Pleasant, and of course you had Thompson here on uh, the north end of Sullivan's Island. I say the north end, you've got to, you, you see how it's laid out, but north is actually this direction. And off the map, you can't see, but I've got Clinton and Cornwallis uh, way over here. So these are the relative distances. Um, uh, it was about four and a half miles from Fort, the Fort on Sullivan's Island to Charleston and about three miles from any help here on the north end of Sullivan's Island. So now we get into the battle. So on the morning of June 28, 1776, Moultrie decides to set out on horseback to confer with Colonel Thompson in his position. And it, it is his leaving the fort that accounts for General Lee not being able to find him and relieve him of command. When Moultrie gets here, he and Thompson kind of look over their shoulders in this direction. So he's, he's gone here, they're looking over here, and what they see is that nine of Parker's warships are moving in the direction of Sullivan's Island. And so Moultrie gets back on his horse and gallops back to the fort as quick as he can, where he calls all of his men to their battle stations. And so at about 10.30 or 11 o'clock in the morning, these nine ships are arrayed off of Sullivan's Island. Um, these two right here really are, are a little further back, but there's two lines with these four and these three. And, and here's a pretty good representation of what I'm talking about here. And they start bombarding the fort. Now the opening shot was fired by the ship, the Thunder. Let me go back to um, one of these. The Thunder was uh, what's called a bomb ship, which really was a ship that carried a mortar. Now uh, think ahead a couple of decades and you've heard the phrase, the bombs bursting in air. Does that ring a bell? Well, this was the kind of, of ship that was firing the bombs that were bursting in air. So there you go. Um, and in any way, the first, the first shot that the thunder fired actually landed in the swamp right next to the magazine um, and fortunately didn't blow up the magazine or the, the whole thing would have been over right there. So they start firing back and forth at each other over about 10 hours. And the British ships are firing as fast and as furious as they can. But here inside the fort, they're greatly limited in the amount of gunpowder they have. So they, Moultrie in, instructs his cannoneers to fire uh, only one shot every 10 minutes and to aim very carefully. And if they couldn't see through the smoke, to hold their fire until they could. So, about an, after, an hour after it all starts, um, 
Peter Parker signals these three ships here to pull out of the line and to swing around to over here, like, like this. The back line's supposed to swing around and go over here where they can enfilade the fort from this direction. And Moultrie said if they had been able to do that, the battle would have been over. But remember the diagram that I showed you that showed the sandbars? Well, there's a sandbar right there and all three of those ships got stuck right there on that sandbar, um, pretty much putting them out of the battle for the rest of the day. That's just a zoom in on that. So that was really a critical point in the battle. Um, you could, Clinton couldn't cross and these ships couldn't get in position to inflate the fort. This is again from the Charleston Museum shows the ship stuck on the sandbar. This picture was painted in 1823 by John Blake White, whose father was inside the fort during the battle. And it just gives you an idea of what it might look like uh, from the inside of the fort during the battle. Um, let's see, the uh, British fired, um, let me see, I gotta check my notes to make sure I've got this right so I don't tell you wrong, okay. By the end of the day, Moultrie had expended 4,700 pounds of powder and 54, um, 5,400 rounds. No, no, no. Okay. 47,000, 40, I'm sorry, y'all. I apologize for getting tongue tied on this. Okay. The Americans in the fort fired 4,700 times it's spending, no, 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 4,700 pounds of gunpowder, 960 shots. That's right. Okay. The British expended 34,000 pounds of gunpowder, firing 12,000 shots. Okay. Now, of these 960 shots that the Americans fired, they hit Parker's uh, uh, flagship over 70 times. Now, at one point during the battle, um, the flag was knocked down, and in a very iconic scene, Sergeant William Jasper jumped down while the cannonballs were uh, coming all around, and he grabbed up the flag, and he, he attached it to a rammer and put it back in its spot. And that's become a very, like I said, iconic moment in American history, but especially in South Carolina history. Before the end of the day, the Americans in the fort suffered 12 killed and 25 wounded, and the British suffered uh, 205 killed and wounded. So why did the British lose? When all the odds were against us, uh, we were outgunned seven to one, we were outmanned four to one, we were in a fort that our commander thought was a death trap. Uh, a lot of people in Charleston agreed. There was no escape route. With all of that, what could go wrong? Well, really, what could go right? So one of the reasons that the British lost that battle was that uh, Peter Parker and Henry Clinton just never got their act together. They never really uh, talked. The second reason is, of course, because Henry Clinton could not get from Long Island to Sullivan's Island. The third reason is because um, of the tactics employed by Peter Parker in, a t in attacking the fort. Now, if you look at this picture here, see how close the, the ships are to the fort? And in this one too? Well, that's not actually what happened. This is the artist's rendition of, ha of what happened. Incidentally, this watercolor, which, which uh, James Peel painted before while he was working on this, uh, just sold at auction for $10,000. But this um, painting by a British officer uh, artist gives you a little better idea of what the distance was. And the reason that it was that way was because the black pilots aboard the British ships were too afraid to take the um, 
their ships in tight. Normally a ship would fight a fort by getting in close. The Marines in the rigging would sweep the parapets of the gunners. And that's how they would beat a fort. But, but they, they would not get close. And their excuse was that they said the water was not deep enough. And uh, four years later, when Clinton came back and captured uh, Charleston, he had himself rowed right out here in a rowboat and he sounded the water himself and found that in fact it was actually uh, deep enough. This painting by Henry Gray shows the proportions and the distances just about as accurately as any piece of uh, artwork I found on the subject. Not to forget the football fields. It was about uh, 400 yards and this is all done to scale. These are the names of the four ships in the front row. And this is the number of guns on each ship. Of course, only half of them could point in any direction at a given time. In the fort, there were 31 guns, but only about 20 of them could point in the right direction. And here again, um, John Blake White's painting depicts it pretty well, I think. And then the last reason that the British lost was because their attempt to um, flank the fort failed. So this is a summary slide. It shows you the American factors and the British factors. And I, I list one more American factor, divine intervention that I honestly believe was pivotal in winning this battle. But um, truly, if you look at the reasons on the American side and the reasons on the British side, if you changed any single one of these factors, uh, I believe that the outcome of the battle would have been completely different. So now where does the Declaration of Independence um, fit in? I see um, Randy Hammond adjusting himself in the seat. We're finally uh, getting to something that he's interested in here. So uh, anyway, yeah, the Declaration of Independence. Well, it turns out that while Clinton was landing on Sullivan's Island, that was about the same time that Congress was appointing five gentlemen to draft the Declaration of Independence, okay? Now, while they were working as hard as they could to get the fort ready for the impending attack, that was when um, Franklin and Adams and Jefferson were, were really getting it ready. And at the very moment, that the British ships were blazing away at the fort on Sullivan's Island at the very same time. That's when uh, Sherman, Livingston, Hamilton, Jefferson, and Franklin were presenting it to the Continental Congress for the first time. Now, here in Philadelphia, they had no idea what was going on in South Carolina at that moment. They, they knew that the British were headed that direction, but they really didn't know exactly where they were going or what they were going to do when they got there. But they knew something was up, but they certainly did not know that the fort on Sullivan's Island was under attack. And then on July 2nd, while Charleston celebrated victory in Philadelphia, as you know, Congress voted that the United Colonies should be now were uh, free and independent states and arguably July 2nd might um, even be called Independence Day. But of course, uh, two days later on July the 4th, the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence um, in an astounding act of courage. So, as you know, on um, August 2nd, um, they, they, I guess maybe 50 of the 56 um, delegates uh, gathered and signed the Declaration of Independence. And um, something quite remarkable happened between the time they voted for independence and voted to adopt the Declaration and August 2nd. And that was the arrival on um, July 19th of word from Charleston of the battle. So they find out that the battle's been fought in Charleston and, um, you know, it was, it was clear 
that David could in fact slay Goliath. Um, victory against uh, improbable odds was possible. It had been achieved in South Carolina. It could be achieved again. And it, in one stroke, Americans had declared their independence and demonstrated by force of arms that they could defend it. And the news of, of what had gone on in Charleston must certainly have stiffened their resolve at the time of signing. Now, we can only speculate that if Moultrie and his men had abandoned the fort to the British, the Redcoats would have established a foothold in Charleston and then South Carolina and then the entire South. An American defeat in Charleston may have completely altered the course of the war. At the very least, it would have thrown a wet blanket on the reception of the Declaration of Independence. On the other hand, British success in Charleston might have been like grabbing the tiger by the tail. You know, you don't want to hold on, but you can't let go either. Um, would they have been able to hold their position there? I, I really don't know. Would the loyalists uh, have risen up to assist them? Uh, really hard to say. Would South Carolina have soon belonged to the British? These are all rhetorical questions that are very interesting to contemplate. Um, but one thing, while the Battle of Sullivan's Island and the Declaration of Independence are not intrinsically connected, by occurring virtually simultaneously, they were synergistic in their mutual effects. And what I mean by that is news of the Declaration just added to the elation of victory in Charleston, and news of the victory at Sullivan's Island added to the enthusiasm of newly declared independence in Philadelphia. Even so, I think everybody fully appreciated that there was going to be a long road ahead. Now, what happened to Colonel William Moultrie after the battle? Well, um, he became a national hero along with uh, the other guys that were with him on Sullivan's Island. And he, and he actually um, received the thanks of the Continental Congress. Uh, by 1777, the Palmetto Tree had been incorporated into the South Carolina seal and eventually became part of what's probably the most iconic state flag in the in the United States. Uh, Moultrie uh, continued to fight in South Carolina. He won a victory over the British um, in Beaufort, South Carolina. He fought a, um, a very masterful tactical retreat across the South Carolina Low Country in 1779, and he was captured in Charleston in 1780, along with everybody else. Now, the British tried to buy him off by promising restoration of his property and his slaves and all, and he was absolutely indignant of, that they would make him such an offer and, and of course, refused. After the, uh, the war, he um, became the founding member in South Carolina of the Society of Cincinnati. Uh, he was a two-term governor of the state, and he was on the board of directors of the Santee Canal Company uh, in 1800. And in 1791, he, he pretty much played the part of South Carolina's unofficial host when George Washington uh, visited Charleston as part of his southern tour. When he died in 1805, for um, almost a century, his grave was lost until it was uh, founded by, found by uh, archaeologists and he was exhumed. And, and here's his, where he was reinterred uh, behind the fort that now um, is his namesake, Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island. Now, I want to point out this little island here is called Chutes Folly. It's right off the Charleston Peninsula. And if you look, it's still there. And there is a little fort there uh, called Castle Pinckney. This was constructed during the uh, War of 1812. And, and you're probably wondering by now, why in the world am I talking about Castle Pinckney and Charleston Harbor? But I wanted to get, wanted you to get a good look at what it, what it is because in 1930, it was proposed that a monument to William Moultrie um, 
be erected on Castle Pinckney. And to give you an idea of uh, the size that that would be, of course, here's my ever-present football field. And, you know, I always like to adapt it to, the, to who I'm talking to. But that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah. I can see Victoria is uh, really appreciating that. But they never built that, of course. Instead, uh, he um, has a very nice monument in White Point Garden um, in the Battery on the, on the tip of the Charleston Peninsula. And this was vandalized um, once before a few years ago with some spray paint. And they, they cleaned it up, but I'm, I'm happy to say, knock on wood, that, um, that nothing's been done to it. Um, lately. And so this um, pretty much concludes my talk.